Welcome to episode 134 of This Week in Linux, your weekly source for Linux GNU's. From the Destination Linux Network, I'm Michael Tanell. If you're new to the show, this is the podcast that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take as a 20-year-plus Linux user. Coming up on this week's episode, we've got an update for you about a CentOS alternative from Cloud Linux called Alma Linux. The company Slimbook announced a new laptop called the Slimbook Titan, and it is a very interesting piece of hardware with AMD Ryzen 7 and NVIDIA RTX 3070. We'll talk a lot about that. We've also got releases from big open source projects like Wine 6.0 and Flatpak 1.10. We've also got some interesting distro news from Fedora and a new OS called Jing OS, which has a very iPad-like design. In the app news, we'll talk about Mozilla's VPN now available for Linux, and we'll end the show with a big humble bundle bonanza. We've got all that and much more coming up right now on This Week in Linux. Before we get started this week, I just want to let you know about a couple things related to DLN. For example, the DLNlive.com and DLNstore.com. Both are great websites. You should definitely bookmark, check it out, especially DLN Live, because this is where you can watch the live shows for This Week in Linux podcast, as well as the Destination Linux podcast. So be sure to bookmark that and join me on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Time or 1800 UTC, or on Sundays for Destination Linux, where it's also the same time at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC, and you can go to dealinstore.com to get awesome shirts like this, This Week in Linux podcast, or the uh, the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt that is also available there, and so much more coming soon, so check it out, dealinstore.com and dealinlive.com. Uh, first in the show this week, we're going to talk about Alma Linux. This is a fork of RHEL. It's a CentOS alternative that is being made by the Cloud Linux team. So this is a free Linux OS for the community, and they are planned to have the first release in the somewhere in quarter one of this year. And this is this is we talked about this previously in the announcement when CentOS. Uh, when Red Hat announced that CentOS was going to be changing to CentOS streams and that sort of stuff, uh, and this is we talked about it as a term of Project Linux. Linux. Uh, it's L E N I X is what they were calling. It. I, I was very hoping that I was hoping so much they would change that name, and they did. So good job there, changing that to Alma Linux is also kind of a cool name. So I'll talk about like what that means later on. But who is Cloud Linux, right? So this company's business is taking RHEL and CentOS code and fine tuning it into their Cloud Linux OS. This is a business Linux distro that is customized, like optimized for like high performance, uh, lightweight usage and stuff for uh, servers on web and server hosting companies and that sort of stuff, so, like shared hosting sites and that kind of thing. And they've had like 10 years experience building and hardening uh, CentOS Linux for data centers and hosting companies. And so this means that they have a lot of experience in doing things like expert uh, expertise in like infrastructure, kernel development, development, open source software development for the project and that sort of stuff. So this is a really interesting uh, potential option for people who are looking for an alternative to CentOS since the announcement from Red Hat. Uh, they all In a quote, I just want to give you from the Alma Linux team, they say, what motivates us to do this? They say that we're already doing it. Experience with RHEL forks towards Cloud Linux, and we have the staff, the capabilities, and the resources. And frankly, we want to put ourselves on the map re regarding Cloud Linux and kernel care it is worth the effort, we think. So I think this is a good point because one, in terms of having an opportunity for marketing, this does get their name out there quite a bit. And also having the track record that they do have makes it a lot more appealing for a lot of people who want an alternative for CentOS and don't want to use something like Oracle because, you know, Oracle is terrible in my opinion. Uh, I mean, when you try to destroy APIs and programming as we know it, uh, never going to use your stuff. Uh, that's Oracle, by the way not Cloud Linux. <laughs> anyway, going back, uh, Cloud Linux is committed to supporting this distribution until at least 2029, they say. And they also said they're going to invest a minimum of $1 million per year to its development. And they've also said that uh, pretty much it's going to be a binary compatible thing, which by the way, for quick note, they're calling it one-to-one -one binary compatible, not bug-to-bug -bug compatible like other projects. So, you know, take that down, note that pro tip, Bug to bug is a really weird way of saying it. So don't use that. Use binary compatible. There you go. 
Anyway, they also saying that the community is going to be involved in the key decision making with this. They're also going to have an organization that's open source governed. So there's going to be a partnership between the company and also the community for governing the project. Uh, they also say that they're going to have it where it's going to be an effortless transition from CentOS with a minimal investment. And they say no software changes. If you want to switch from CentOS to Alma Linux when it's ready, it, it takes only one command. So there'll be zero switching downtime and migrations for even large server fleet will be possible in an instant, they say. So that is very interesting. The Almond Linux names is also interesting, and I want to talk about that for a second because their, their reasoning for doing it is kind of cool. So Alma is a Latin word for soul, and they say that they chose the name Alma Linux in honor of the tireless efforts of the Linux community. They say, just like every developer and every user that relies on Linux-powered OS, we at Cloud Linux benefit from the dedicated and often selfless efforts of the Linux community. This community is the soul of Linux. And I think that's just really cool. I think that's a, a really nice way of putting it, and it's a really interesting way of you know describing the community as a whole because I totally agree. The soul of Linux is the community, and one of the best things about being a part of the Linux ecosystem is the Linux community in general. So I like that. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about Alma Linux or other stuff that Cloud Linux does, I'll have links in the show notes below, so check that out. Up next in the show is the latest release of the Wine Project, which is a big major release of 6.0, and that has been rolled out and has over, uh, well, around 8,300 individual changes for this release. And there's a lot of things that are in this release. The change log is huge. So we're just going to cover the highlights. So the there's a new there's new features in the Direct3D 11 support for uh, per-render target blend states, dual source blending, multi-sample, anti-aliasing sample maps, that sort of stuff. Also support for Direct3D Direct 3D 9 alpha to coverage multi-sampling has been added. There's been uh, experimental Vulkan backend support for Wine D3D. Direct show and media foundation support has been adding, allowing more, uh, many more types of media from Windows games and applications to work and that sort of stuff. Also support for more graphics cards and newer graphics drivers. Uh, core modules and PE format is now available. This is to help a number of copy protection schemes that check that the DLL files in on disk match the in-memory content, so that makes it uh, these applications run better and more performant. And also, you know, get through the copy protection issues. Not necessarily saying that you can't. Anyway, it's not like a, it's not a hacking thing. It's just more in the sense of like letting it recognize that it is a valid thing. Uh, and also, uh, initial USB kernels driver support has been added. Uh, raw input device support, as well as WebSocket API support has been added. And also something that's kind of interesting is the mouse position history is now implemented for games that want to have more precise mouse positions, which is really nice. It also has better multi-monitor support. And let's talk about the quick difference between Wine and Proton, because I'm sure a lot of people are kind of curious, what's the difference between Wine and Proton? Well, if you... If you like a much clearer explanation, let me know in the comments and I'll make a video on this specifically. But the gist of it is, Wine is essentially the base for Proton, and Proton is built with gaming in mind. Uh, Wine and Proton are quite similar, but Wine is a more conservative in their development, so they take longer for their releases and they, you know, they're more focused on the stability of stuff and things like that versus the compatibility and quick support and that sort of stuff. So it's not that saying that Proton is not caring about stability, it's more is like they care about focused on getting the game support as fast as possible. And it's also worth noting that Proton doesn't wait for wine releases to implement new wine features. So those wondering how long it will be for them to wait for Proton 6 to come out, well, you don't really have to do that because much of the work in Wine 6 is already in the latest version of Proton in the Proton 5 series, so you don't really have to wait for that. So this is, it's, it's uh, there's a significant difference. If you want to learn more, let me know in the comments below and I'll make a video about that. I am also very excited that so much work is going into Wine and Proton these days because while I personally don't use Windows, there are some Windows-focused apps that do interest me uh, quite a bit. And uh, so I'm really happy that there's a lot of work in this in this space. And if you'd like to learn more about this latest release of Wine 6.0, I'll have a, the announcement post from the Wine HQ in the show notes below. Up next in the show is a big announcement from the Flatpak team if they've released 1.10 
of the flat pack format. So this comes with a new repo format that should make updates faster and download less data. It also um, uh, isolates metadata based on the CPU architecture used by the client and supports Delta based incremental updates, which means that the metadata can be retrieved faster, which will lower the bandwidth usage and that sort of stuff, as well as many other optimizations. And also the flat hub has been already uh, implemented the support for this new format, which is really cool. And it also helps uh, flat hub support more CPU architectures. So for example, having uh, x86 and arm flat packs will be possible thanks to this format, which is awesome. Uh, in additional features, there's also an automatic uninstall for end of life runtimes during flat pack update operations. So if the runtime becomes end of life and no longer maintained or supported, it will be automatically removed from your system, which is really cool. Uh, better finding of pulse audio and uncommon configurations, making it easier for the flat packs to support audio and some previous times where some flat packs didn't really pick uh, detect a pulse audio as well. So this fixes that. And also it now has access to the system D resolve D socket to do DNS lookups in sandboxes with network access, which is really good because there allows you to do certain things about uh, basically having network access on certain applications aren't isn't necessary, but sometimes it is. And when they switch to doing the system D resolve D, it makes it better for the socket DNS lookups to be more efficient. And it also gives you a lot more control in the flat pack development, so which is really nice. And also flat packs repo um, like flat hub can benefit in a new summary file format that mark all FOSS apps and allow uh, users to see, to use like a floss, a uh, fl flat, uh, flat hub dash FOSS remote style without the need to maintain two uh, separate repositories. And I think this is great, not only for the option to be there for the users, but also distros that insist only on having uh, FOSP only packages by default. They can now possibly start shipping FlatHub pre-configured to use it, which is, I think is great news. And if you'd like to learn more about this latest release of the format, and you'll, you'll find links in the show notes below for that. Also, and if you'd like for me to make a video about why flat packs and other universal formats are important to Linux, then be sure to leave a comment and let me know. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by DigitalOcean and their app platform. DigitalOcean's app platform service is a solution to build modern cloud native apps. Use a simple, intuitive, and visually rich experience to rapidly deploy, build, manage, and scale apps. It has support for multiple languages like Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby. It also has support for static sites and Docker. And it has high scalability with a zero infrastructure management structure. So uh, what does that mean? Well, you simply point your GitHub repository and let the app platform do all the heavy lifting for you. It handles the infrastructure like the app runtimes and the dependencies so that you can push code to production in just a few clicks. It also does securing apps autom automatically while by, because they can create, manage, and renew your SSL certificates and also protect your apps from DDoS attacks just automatically for you, which is awesome. Also, you can run code with little to no customization. The app platform uses uh, cloud-native standards and automatically analyzes your code, creates containers, and runs them on Kubernetes clusters. And as a listener of This Week in Linux podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free, actually better than free, because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform. And we want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is really something that is very interesting to me, and that is a new laptop from the Slimbook company called the Slimbook Titan. It has uh, it's actually it has AMD and NVIDIA, and it has new hardware that are that were just basically just announced at CES because uh, this week. The AMD and NVIDIA announced new AMDs. Uh, they have new CPUs for, with a Ryzen 7 um, Zen 3 mobile line. And also there's new GPUs from NVIDIA that are mobile-based. And this is really cool because this Slimbook Titan contains both of them. So this is a 8-core, 3.2 gigahertz AMD Ryzen 7 5800H. The Ryzen 5000 series mobile CPUs is kind of like the proper mobile edition of the AMD's Zen 3 line. And AMD are claiming that it's up to 16% increase in single-threaded performance and up to 14% increase in multi-threaded performance over the previous generation, which is really nice. And in terms of the GPU, the latest NVIDIA RTX 3070 is included with this, and it has 8 gigs of VRAM. And NVIDIA says that the 3060 is faster than the PS5, 
uh, the PS5 GPU, so likely the 3070 is even faster than that. And in the RAM parts, so we have 16 gigs by default, but it goes up to 64 gigs of RAM of DDR4 RAM running at 3200 megahertz. And uh, Ryan, aka DOS Geek, my, uh, my co host of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts podcast, has mentioned that laptops with a premium price should start shipping. Uh, should stop shipping 1080p displays because they are no longer premium, so they shouldn't be in premium products. Well, Ryan, apparently Slimbook has listened to you because the Slimbook Titan comes with a 15.6-inch 2K display with a 2560 by 1440p resolution and 165 hertz refresh rate. So it's even it's a pretty good re, uh, hertz refresh rate as well. So it's not just a 60 hertz 2K, it's a 165 hertz 2K display, which is really nice. And if you want to find out what else makes up Ryan's dream laptop, check out episode 17 of Hardware Addicts and episode 207 of Destination Linux, where he talks about this. And also for this this piece of uh, kit, this laptop has 500 gigabyte NVMe uh, plus storage that comes with it. It also has support for Wi-Fi 6 AX support. It has uh, three USB 3.0 ports, one USB Type C port that has support for Display Port as well. That's a lot of ports. I just said that a lot. Uh, also, it has support for HDMI, and also has something really interesting: an infrared facial recognition camera which has support fully for Linux. So that's odd and cool at the same time. Not sure if I want that, but cool that I can have it. But in addition to that, it also has a really nice slick design. It has a black aluminum chassis. It has optical mechanical RGB keyboard where the RGB is per key. So you can in, you can change that for whatever key you want. And also it has a BIOS customization options, options for that, which is very cool. It looks like a very nice laptop and the price well it uh it kind of fits along with all this all the specs and the hardware in there <laughs> so it's uh the launch price which is discounted starts at 1599 euros which is around uh, 1900 ish usd and this they're available for pre-orders right now but uh, they're going to be shipping in may so if you want to order it you'll have to be waiting till may to get one but this is really really interesting i think this laptop looks one it looks great it, I actually do like the RGB per key. I know the RGB thing doesn't really matter, but it does give a little bit of an oomph to the laptop. I do like that. And also having the new Ryzen 7 Zen 3 mobile uh, chip for the uh, CPU and also the new G, uh, GPU with NVIDIA 3070. Uh, I'm not much of an a, uh, NVIDIA fan, but this combination does look really, really awesome. And also having a 2K display, I mean... I don't know if I would get this because the price is a little bit out of my budget, but at the same time, in terms of if you're if you're looking for a high-end premium laptop, this looks like it could be a great option for that. So if you want to learn more, I'll have a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show is something that I have been wanting for quite a long time because Fedora announced this uh, silver blue structure, which is an immutable desktop operating system that has the GNOME workflow. And I do think that's cool, but I was really hoping for at some point having a silver blue with KDE Plasma, and that is what they're doing. So Fedora Kinoite has uh, is basically an immutable desktop operating system featuring the KDE Plasma desktop based on the same technologies as Fedora Silver Blue. So what exactly is Silver Blue? What's a immutable desktop? Essentially, it means that it's a read-only by default file system with a layered structure, and it also has atomic updates, which is really cool because this allows you to do a lot of interesting things in terms of like not having to worry about the stability and the reliability of the system. And it also allows you to switch back and forth between different branches without having to worry about any kind of compatibility breakage. Like you could go from rawhide to stable to uh, updates testing branch and a back and forth, all kinds of stuff without and having to worry about doing so, breaking your system, which is really cool. And it also allows for people who are using like a container-focused workflow being able to more easily do that because essentially this uh, silver blue makes it you know very compatible with the concept of using a container-focused workflow. And also, this uh, Fedora Kinoate is like Fedora Silverblue having the uh, OS, OS, RPM OS tree, Flatpak, and Podman powering this is the same kind of thing that the Silverblue is. And you might have noticed that I called it Kinoite at one point and Kinoate at another point. And that's because, well, 
There's not an official pronunciation yet because uh, in speaking with uh, Neil, who is currently at the st- in the, the the recording studio right now for the show, I asked him if it was Kinoite, and he said no, it's Kino- uh, Kinoite. And turns out both of those fit pretty well with the the terms of this, you know, for the KDE plasma version because. Uh, Kinoite is a blue mineral, which also starts with a K, so it kind of fits with the whole KDE scheme. And Kinoite me is Japanese for the phrase "there is a tree," and since silver blue is powered by OS tree, it kind of fits perfectly both ways. So I'm curious, what does the community prefer, Kinoite or Kinoite? Uh, I kind of like Kinoite a little bit more because it's just more fun to say, but that's up to you. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Uh, and just be clear, uh, Kinoite or Kinoite is not an official Fedora edition yet, but it is currently planned to be one for Fedora 35. And also, it is available right now for using if you want to test it out, but it is for people who just want to do testing. And they are they have announced that there's going to be other variants of Silver Blue, maybe not in official capacity, but other people who are interested in uh, can check out the other Silver Blue variants for XFCE, Mate, Deepin, Pantheon, and LS Cute. Uh, those are currently in like a very early stages, so it's not really uh, going to be an official edition at any point at this moment. But maybe in the future it could be. But uh, if you want to check out F- Fedora's uh, Kinoite uh, or Kinoite, whichever one, again. Check it. I'll have links in the show notes below to check that out. And also, let me know which one you prefer in the show notes or not. What? No, that's not how that works. Let me know in the comments because that's the thing you can actually do. Yeah, anyway. Up next in the show is we have an announcement from Mozilla that the Mozilla VPN is now available for Linux. So uh, you can actually check out the global network of servers powered by Molvad that is used by Mozilla. And uh, they use the WireGuard protocol to do this. And this is really interesting because, well, they first came out with Mozilla VPN originally in July 2020. So it's been about six months since it came to, before it came to Linux. And that's a little bit disappointing. But uh, for those who are wondering why this is interesting is because, well, one, it's cool that Mozilla is doing it because I do like supporting Mozilla. And uh, also the fact that they're using WireGuard. And why are they using WireGuard? Well, WireGuard is a protocol that encrypts the network traffic, protecting all the private information and that sort of stuff. And also compared to existing uh, VPN protocols, WireGuard is a very lightweight code. It's easier for security analysis to review and audit it for that kind of thing, making it kind of a more secure option in terms of using a VPN because you know what it's doing is uh, is, is more easily auditable in comparison to the other things. And they also currently have a Mozilla VPN in uh, six regions, uh, US, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, and Malaysia. And they do say that more uh, regions are coming soon. And the cost is not cheap. It's not like the cheapest option you'll find. But they also say that they're making up for it with speeds because the subscription cost is $4.99 a month. And they say that they have more than 280 servers available in over 30 countries, and there's no bandwidth restrictions, and they don't store activity logs. So that's another important thing. They say that we don't log, track, or share any of your network activity. We adhere strictly to Mozilla's data privacy principles, and we only collect the most minimal data required to keep the VPN healthy and operational. Your online activities can stay anonymous because we never log, track, or share your network data. So... It's interesting because while I am annoyed that it took them six months to give us a Linux client, at least we finally have one, so that's cool. And I also like, um, I also like a reasonable option to contribute to Mozilla because being able to contribute to Mozilla but also getting a, a great service in that sense is really cool. And also the fact that it's backed by Molvad, it's nice because Molvad has been around for a while. Uh, and this is one of the things that I've wanted Mozilla to do as a part of a like a suite of apps and services to compete against things like Google and that sort of stuff. And I'm glad they're finally taking this action. But really, Mozilla, I mean, Linux should always be the top of your list. So, you know, learn from your mistake this time and fix it going forward. And uh, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt going forward from now. But it was six months. I mean, come on. That's ridiculous. Anyway, I am happy to see that they're going through this process of doing these services and that sort of stuff. That's really cool. If you want to learn more about this particular service or you want to check it out for yourself, I have links in the show notes below. 
This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. You can get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash DLN. A password manager is software that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do that? Well, securing your online accounts is very important because the best security practice for passwords is to have a different password for every account on every website that you sign up to. And sure, that makes sense as a policy, but... How do you keep track with all that stuff? Because that's a pretty painful thing to do. But with a password manager, you can do that. And Bitwarden solves this by providing tools to store all of your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to do that, which is awesome. And you can have access to your data across many types of devices like your web browser, using their mobile apps, desktop application, or even on the command line. And Bitwarden seals your private data with end-to-end -end encryption before it ever even leaves your devices so that you know that you're the only person who has access to your data. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust because it is open source. In addition to all these great features, it is open source and that means that they have the ability to vet the code. The community has the ability to vet the code and improve the code, as well as they don't just stop there. They also do third-party security audits where they hire third-party firms to audit their code to make sure it is safe as possible. So go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And did I mention you can get started for free? Well, you can, but I think you'll want to check out their premium account anyway because you get one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiQ, U2O, Duo, Vault Health Reports, a Bitwarden Authenticator app, app the t for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. And you get all of this for less than $1 per month. That's right, less than $1 per month. Make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. So let's, it lets you get a peace of mind with your for your passwords and other sensitive data while also supporting a company that truly gets open source. Sign up for their $10 per year or, as I said, less than $1 per month. And if you get a premium account to get all those extra features and let them know that you appreciate them supporting open source and supporting the This Week in Linux podcast. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started. And thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show, we're going to talk about a new Linux distribution called JingOS. So JingOS is trying to answer Apple's age-old question, what's a computer with their new distro? They say that it's the world's first iPad OS style Linux desk distro, and it has a iPad OS like UI and UX designed specifically for tablets. They seem to have leaned heavily into the iPad style because it will absolutely remind you of an iPad interface in many ways. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It does look quite good in this interface. It has some very nice looking icons and some smooth animations demoed in their announcement video. It also has support for uh, multi-touch gestures, which is something I talked about in my latest video on my channel for GNOME 40. Uh, you know, hashtag shameless plug, ships with several custom Linux apps that they made specifically for mobile, like a calendar, a timer app, a media player, a calculator, and stuff like that. And it's not just a tablet interface either. It's also a full Linux distro based on Ubuntu. So you can run things like LibreOffice, text editors, terminals, and more. So it, it's, it's focused on the purpose of being a tablet interface and that sort of workflow, but it also supports for pretty much any application you want. Uh, it only currently has a compatibility with two devices as it, it's in the very early stages of the project, uh, like the Surface Pro 6 and the Huawei MateBook 14 that has a touchscreen. Like those are the ones that it supports right now. And they have said that they plan to support mold, more devices in the future and also add support for ARM devices. So I think this is really, really interesting. They say in their video announcement video that an early version of Jingo S will be available for download at the end of January. So very close. And uh, it, it really looks quite nice and it does, it does kind of feel a lot like uh, the iPad. It has like the command center sort of stuff or the command central, that sort of stuff. And it's really slick looking. And uh, I definitely want to try it out. I don't have the devices that I would need to try it out. So maybe they'll have a virtual machine that you can play with, hopefully. Um, anyway, I think this is pretty cool. Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think about this uh, style of having a distro built for tablets that then also has the ability to use certain applications, or do you prefer an application like a distro being built for desktop usage that also has the ability to run on a tablet in an interface style? Like, what is your preference of the what should be starting from the starting point? in these kinds of things. Anyway, let me know in the comments below what you think about that. And if you want to check out Jing OS, you know, the announcement video and all that, I'll have links in the show notes below. Up next in the show is some interesting news from the TeamSpeak team. And that is that TeamSpeak 5 will be based on the Matrix protocol. 
That's right. This is really interesting. So in the announcement for the beta of the TeamSpeak 5, they say, the biggest change we've made will affect our chat features. In fact, it's already affecting it. Based on your feedback, we went for a full revamp of major changes to our backend, contact lists, direct messages, and group chats. Our new chat pad has been designed with your privacy and security in mind, which is why it will provide a federated real-time communication system where you can host your own services on your own infrastructure. And while this official statement doesn't necessarily mention specifically Matrix, uh, if you dig around enough in their forum, it says that uh, they actually have confirmed it. Uh, TeamSpeak's Chris R. confirmed it in their forum that the new chat solution is uh, in a comment thread. He says that we use the Matrix protocol only for the messenger part. The rest does not require a different TeamSpeak server. So this is related to the chat stuff and that sort of thing. Uh, the actual communications through the voice chat, that's still going to be going through TeamSpeak's uh, software, uh, which makes sense because they wouldn't want to replace it and at the same time because Matrix Protocol it doesn't really have a feature complete in terms of the uh, voice chat part. So that kind of makes sense. And you may be thinking to yourself, TeamSpeak, that's a name I haven't heard in a while. And I have to agree with that because I thought it was it was just interesting to find that they are switching to support for Matrix uh, because I think that uh, it's TeamSpeak is still fairly popular. It used to be ridiculously popular, but it's been a long time since I've heard much about that product. Uh, but the fact that they're switching to Matrix Protocol is really interesting, especially since the Matrix Protocol has been gaining a lot of tracks and re traction recently. And I think this news is interesting for the adoption of Matrix more widely. So I'm curious to see how it works when they finally release uh, Teams TeamSpeak 5 with support for Matrix. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and I think it's just, it's just overall interesting that they're implementing Matrix for this purpose because, you know, it, having a... Uh, another client that does this kind of thing that the main the main value of matrix is that it's a decentralized but federated protocol that allows you to have multiple clients and build your own thing out and a lot of the times that you look at the different clients and they're not that great maybe teamspeak will provide a good solution for people who are wanting that kind of thing maybe i don't know it'd be interesting to see what happens with that so that's why i wanted to talk about it there's also a lot of other improvements coming with teamspeak 5 i'll have a link to their forum post talking about these changes in the show notes for you if you want to check those out but i just wanted to talk about the uh the matrix thing because i just think that's really cool just see what happens with that and uh yeah i'll keep you posted on that in the future episodes if there's something that's worth talking about but if you want to learn more about it right now links in the show notes and finally this week, we're going to talk about the Humble Bundle Bonanza that's going on right now. There's a bunch of bundles that are really interesting, including one specifically for Linux. So it's Linux by A-Press. This is a, a Humble Book Bundle that gets you eBooks like the Linux Philosophy for Sysadmins, Using and Administering Linux Volume 1, and Linux Sound Programming, as well as many, many more. And there's also another one for front-end web development by Packet. This is the Humble Book Bundle that gets you books like Learning React, Building Forms with Vue.js, and learning Angular, and many, many more as well. And Annette, the next bundle I want to talk about is the Humble Game Dev Map and Level Creator Bundle. It gets software and assets to build your own game maps and levels like Cartoon Platformer Pack, Fantasy Map Pack, uh, Pixel Art Tile Set Collection, and much more. There's actually quite a few other uh, bundles that I wanted to talk about, like the Music Producer 2 and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, there's not enough time. There's I think there's like nine different ones. Actually, no, ten different ones that I wanted to talk about. So I'll have links to all of those in the show notes if you want to check those out. In, in addition, including the ones I didn't talk about. But I also want to be clear that the links in the show notes are affiliate links. So if you do use those links, uh, that will give a small commission basically to uh, this channel and this podcast to, uh, you know, as like a, you know, as a thank you for promoting it or whatever. I don't know. Uh, if you do decide to purchase these bundles, please use those links below because it does support this channel and this podcast. So yeah, I have links for all of those in the show notes below. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. And also ring that bell to get notified when I make new episodes. And if you'd like to support the show and the channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, and many others. You can go to learn more by going to tuxdigital.com contribute. 
Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to dlnstore.com. You can get the Linux is Everywhere shirt, or you can get the one I'm wearing right now, the This Week in Linux t-shirt, as well as many more. And even we have more items coming, like hats and a bunch of cool stuff, so check that out, dlnstore.com. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of both of those shows on the Destination Linux network. You can go to destinationlinux.network to check those out. And just a reminder, the show is live every Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern or 1800 UTC, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week by going to dlnlive.com. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux Network, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux good news.